a lot of different intentions. I just threw out you, I don't know how many. You can pick one. Use it as long as it works. Free of charge. You can share it with other friends. It's not working, switch it off for another one. Sometimes this works, sometimes this works, sometimes this works, sometimes this works. Make up your own. The idea is we want to do the action of prayer. We want to move our lips. We want our voice to be heard. We want to do the intent of prayer. We want to have the emotion. As we said, before you start praying, prepare yourself and feel your love and fear of God. Let that saturate your prayers. Let your prayers have strong, healthy wings to soar. And this is the last point we we're discussing. Fill your mind with something. Well, obviously I go to a, a synagogue and we pray on Shabbos uh, for sure. And But at home, it's davening three times a day. And also I will have conversations with Hashem called Heat Bodezut and always talk to him through a way of um, like a, it's like a prayer, but talk it to um, Hashem or to the Rebbe. So that's, that's what I do for prayer. So you pray three times a day and you have other times when you're talking to God, not with the words of a prayer book, but with your own words. Exactly. Sounds amazing. Dixie, what about you? Uh, well, I start my morning off when I wake up up with a D, an, an emo D and then I also usually do some just lay in bed and do meditation sometimes that lasts even an hour to two hours it's um, sometimes it's unbelievable sometimes it's just a little bit and then <clears throat> I get up and, and I do my morning prayers the uh, the first morning prayers and then I uh, feed my dog and cat and everything. And then I use the prayer book for some more prayers. And then I get on with my day a little bit. And I end up praying throughout the day whenever something comes up that I need to pray for. So like what Robin was saying, you do try and that's to pray it. twice a day, morning and afternoon prayers, and all day long you're talking to God. Yep, I am. I got to. I can't keep going without him. That could last like two hours in the morning before you even do anything else. Yeah, it does sometimes. It's awesome. Do you want to share with us now? You can. I have a slightly quieter moment. Um, Because like I said, with with all the little kids, so there's there's like what we would like to do, and then there's more what is... happens in a day so at one time we had these beautiful um banana noak like it's one is a blue one that's full of prayers and one is a brown one that is um like just kind of basic guidelines for a noahide and still trying to figure out which bookshelf they got onto at what time and what move um but there was a time when I was reading those every morning and I really loved it. And it was incredible to me. My oldest son would wake up and he would come, I'd sit outside and he'd come join me. And oh my goodness, less than a week of reading these. And he he had like half of them memorized. I just can't believe what little sponges they are at five and six years old. So anyways, so we did that for a while and it was lovely. And we do, um, we do get over to Chabad for like the holidays when we can. Um, we haven't done so much for like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, just with the kids and it's it's kind of a lot so but like for Hanukkah and Purim and Passover we've been able to get over there and occasionally when they do like the Friday services um that's like a big community one we'll get over there when there's room so that's that's where we're at um when people are sick like when my cousin was sick when our neighbor was sick in the art scroll to Hillam that we have, it has, um, like in the beginning, it has like a little guide, you know, if somebody has a baby, if somebody's going for a job, if you're going on it on, if you're traveling, if, you know, so it says which Psalms to say for which. So we'll read those. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's been plenty of times where like, maybe I'm in the doctor's office and I have 10 minutes and I don't have my knitting and I'll just like pull out, you know, the Chabad to Hillam online and just say like 121 because it's like, that's always a good one. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you're a beautiful, well, well used but Noah High prayer book disappeared at some point? Yeah, they both have. We actually have two blue ones and a brown one and they've uh, absconded again. So we were many, thinking about ordering new many new sets. Develop legs and walk. So I totally understand that. So basically what you're saying is you would love to begin every day with prayers. It doesn't happen that often now. It used to. And now more like you turn to God, um, you turn to God either with your own words or with the words of Psalms and you try to go to the Chabad for holidays or Friday night communal prayer sessions and meals. Okay, so just let me put out a word there before we even get started. There's no obligation on a Noahide to pray in a quorum. Obviously, if it helps, that's beautiful. And if you can have it accessible like Natalie does and Robin does, and I know Dixie does also, um, that's great. And if you don't, that's totally fine. There, there's no need 
if it helps, that's great. If it doesn't work for you, like Natalie was saying in the beginning that it's really difficult with her children. So maybe now is not the time in your life where that's what you're going to be doing. You could go there for community and for friendship and for socialization. But in terms of prayer, you could find quiet moments, hopefully, pray, and that might not be in a service, and that's totally, totally fine. Noahide and prayer, and in general, the idea of prayer and ideas to help us pray and what God wants from us to pray. And is this really the domain of the Noahide? Yes, it is. God wants to hear your voice. God wants you to pray to him. So every Noahide has to find at least once a day. Obviously, some of you are, woo beyond. And Robin said she prays three times a day, plus it's bodedut, plus talking to God, like the rest of us all day long. But at least once a day, you really should find a time for prayer. So I would say like Robin aced out the chart and Danielle, we weren't able to hear from. I mean, I mean, Dixie did too. Lane, we weren't able to hear from. And Natalie, I would say it's good to, you don't have to aim for three times a day. You don't have to aim for twice a day. But I would say once a day, you should figure out a time when your children are not going to be bothering you, like maybe after breakfast, if they're quietly playing at some point, <laughs> we can pretend where you can pray to God. Now you have the luxury of creating your own prayers. If you can't find your prayer book, if the words in the prayer book don't resonate with you, that's totally allowed for a Noahide. But God wants to hear your voice in a regular way of prayer. So I do think it's good to get into somewhat into your pattern at some point in the day. And ideally earlier is better when you are know that this is my time to officially talk to God. And of course, as Robin said, and as Dixie said, we're talking to God all day long. And I would say, of course I talk to God all day long, please. How would I survive one day without talking to God all day long? So definitely I talk to God all day long, but I also pray three times a day and I also say Psalms. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm saying this, this idea of having once a day, some fixed time, it could be five fixed minutes where you're really focusing on your relationship to God. You're talking to him, you're asking him for your needs and you're trying to connect. Now, if you would like to use Psalms as the vehicle of your prayer, that's totally fine because on, to be honest, a lot of our prayer is Psalms, tremendous chunk of our prayer. I never figured out the percentage, but quite a high percentage of prayer is Psalm. And again, as a Noahide, you have a little bit of freedom here, wiggle room. So if mm -hmm. you say, well, I don't know where my Noahide prayer book is, but I do know where my English Hebrew Psalms are. And you want to decide every day you want to pick three Psalms to say, or you want to say your husband's, yourselves, yourselves and uh, your children, mm -hmm. and then use that time, not only doing that, but like, this is my prayer. As I'm saying each Psalm, I'm praying to God for health and for success and for prosperity and for emotional healing and peace and relationships, anything else on your heart, you could pray as you say those Psalms. And that could be your prayer session with God every single morning or whenever your day it works for you. But ideally earlier is better only because then we're starting off our day with prayer, which of course is a very good way to start off the day and it sort of gives a flavor to the entire day. And if it's too much to say everyone's psalm, maybe just say yours and your husband's. Or like you said, maybe say uh, 122 and 123, maybe say 122, 123, 20 and 23, or 20, 23 and 150. Any combination, I, I could send you as many options as you have time to say prayers, <laughs> say psalms, but really that could definitely be prayer. Even before you get your prayer book, you can pray through saying the Psalms, not a problem at all. Now in English, and of course we speak English in this class, we're using the word prayer. In Hebrew, of course, the word is not prayer, not just because, well, prayer is an English word, but it's not the translation. Pray, to pray is in essence to ask. If that was translated in Hebrew, we would call in Hebrew prayer, bakasha. Bakasha means asking, pray, Prayer from the root word pray means to ask in the English. That is not the Hebrew meaning of the word prayer because prayer in Hebrew is the word tefillah, not bakasha, which would mean pray to ask, but tefillah. The root word of tefillah means to connect, to attach yourself, to fuse. Prayer is not overarchingly asking, though we do a lot of that. Prayer is not just a litany of your needs. 
prayer is not a situation that if I have no needs pressing, why bother praying? Because <laughs> it's to ask, and for the moment, I have nothing to ask. The goal of prayer is to feel love, is to fuse with God through this process. And I think what Robin was saying about his bodhidut and what Dixie was saying about meditation, both of them in maybe similar or maybe slightly different techniques are, are really striving for that idea of connection with God. Now, again, that does not mean we don't ask our needs in prayer, and we do. And if you're reading the prayer book, there's a lot of asking for our needs. But that's secondary to the overarching goal, which is connection, fusion, literally the meaning, the etymology of the Hebrew word for prayer, tefillah. We're told tefillah, prayer, is like entering into the Sabbath during the week. It's a weekday, it's a Monday, it's a Sunday, it's a Tuesday, we know weekday. But when we pray, it's like a bubble of Sabbath. We have the spirit and the peace, the serenity of Sabbath in our weekday during prayer. It's like a space of Mashiach. What's gonna happen by Mashiach? God will be completely revealed. So when we're praying, we have on some level God revealed to us. Originally, they didn't have these extensive prayers. Instead, they had sacrifices. And they were daily sacrifices, the morning and the afternoon sacrifice, which is the model our prayers are based on. So now, instead of sacrifices, we pray. Obviously, in the times of the redemption, we will have sacrifices and we will pray because <laughs> we're not going to lose this great advantage we accrued through exile. And I say it's an advantage because in the times of the temple, it was done by the priest to a certain, another certain person, there's a certain time when that sacrifice was offered, and it was a certain place in the temple and very, very, very detailed and precise, the place and the tool, the implement, all of the very, very, very ritualized steps of offerings. Now, the priest, the person is every single one of us. Anyone in the entire world is that priest of God. The time is anytime you wanna call out to God. And the place is anywhere in the world. So in the times of the temple, it was very, very rigid and specific and narrow in terms of person, in terms of place, in terms of time. And now it's become embracive. It's become universal. Any one of us, anytime, in any place, can accomplish what happened biblically in the temple. So it's a huge advantage prayer. And as I said, we have this obligation to turn to God daily, to ask our needs, to acknowledge him, to connect. So those should be three things in your head as you pray, especially if you're doing this extemporaneously, free form, creating your own prayers, which is totally, totally permissible for the Noahide. But these are three aspects of prayers. One aspect is to ask your needs. That's probably the easiest one for us. We probably all have our wish list, maybe a whole laundry list. But prayer also has a component of acknowledging God, which of course makes sense because obviously you're praying, you're acknowledging God. And prayer is connecting to God. That might be the hardest one. To ask our needs. You know what our needs are. To acknowledge God. Well, that's why we're praying. But to connect to God, to really put self aside and fuse with God, that's a primary component of prayer. Now, Robin says she plays three times a day because in traditional Judaism, we pray three times a day parallel to the three times daily of the sacrificial, sorry, that word I think I did not say correctly, the daily sacrifice offering. A woman is not obligated, a Jewish woman is not obligated to pray three times a day. She can, I said, I do. But that is not an obligation. The third time, the evening prayer is completely optional for a woman. But we have the obligation of praying twice a day, in the morning and in the afternoon. A person can say, well, I thought women, Jewish women, are not obligated in time-bound commandments, and prayer seems very time-bound. We could almost view it not as an obligation, but as a privilege. This is the privilege of our connection to God. This is the time we have set aside every single day to remind ourselves of our relationship with God. And as I said, you can't do it three times a day, no need. You can't do it twice a day, fine. You do not have to pray twice a day. Once a day, make sure you pray to God. Pray with a prayer book, pray with a Noahide prayer book, pray with Psalms, pray from your heart. Any and all of those are acceptable. 
But every day, God wants to hear your voice in prayer. You can say, I talk to God all day long. That's true. I'm sure you do. But it should be more formalized than that. You should have your time. Ideally, you should have your place. You should have the sense of now I am entering the chamber of prayer. And during those prayer minutes, however short they are, you want to focus on God to the exclusion of all else, which is why I said to Natalie, find those minutes when your children are not going to be bothering you. It could be very short. Because he said she could have a two hour meditation. Maybe someone could say they could scrape away five minutes to pray. But whatever it is, focus on God. The best way to start off to focus on God and to prepare for prayer is to feel God's love for you. Think of the details of how God has been so good to you lately, how God has been so loving. Think of your most recent kindness, blessing, miracle, fortuitous, as we call it, hashgacha pratis, how God made things work out. When we think of how God expresses his love for us, that helps us feel our love for him. And when you feel that love for God, now you're ready to pray. So it's a very wise introduction to prayer, if it'll take you an extra minute or two or three or four or five, however long it takes, to really take the time to feel God's love for you until that feeling is so strong that you feel love for God. And when you're feeling that real, true love for God, that's when you want to pray. And that's really throughout the duration of prayer what we want. The time of prayer is a time to focus on our love of God. And all day long, we're struggling, you know. (laughs) We've got a lot going on. We've got a lot of different things distracting us and maybe bothering us, maybe tempting us, maybe burdening us. When we pray, and we're feeling our love for God, and we're focusing on God, that's when we're not struggling and being bothered and being tempted by this world. That's when we have our God time of the day. That's why I said prayer is like Sabbath in the weekday. Prayer is like a taste of the redemption. Because prayer is this time when you're not dealing with other stuff. Prayer is when you're not doing your list. Prayer is when you're talking to God when you're feeling your love for him, when you're communicating with him, when you're bonding with him, you're praying. Our prayers are compared to a bird. The sages say that a bird needs wings to fly. And a bird actually cannot fly on one wing. A bird actually needs two wings to fly. If it only has one wing, it's not going to fly. And our wings to take our prayers and send them up to heaven are the two primary emotions of love and fear of God. So every time we pray, I said we should start the prayer by focusing on how much God loves us, which elicits how much I love him. But we also want to bring in there our fear, our awe, a real sense of like, wow, you know, God is so powerful. So many things happen to so many people and look how God is protecting me. I can feel in awe. I can feel nullified. I can feel subsumed. I want all those feelings because that's going to help my fear factor. So really when I pray, I would like to have both. If you're not like Natalie said, there's what we'd like and then what we do. So if you're not up to doing that, at least make sure you start your prayers thinking of how much God loves you and then feel how much you love God and then pray. And even better, if you can also focus on the sense of the specialty of the relationship, how gifted you are, how precious it is, how rare, how fortunate you are. Any of your family and friends even know about this. And you have this opportunity to to go into the palace. Envision prayer as you're walking into the palace. You're walking into the most inner chambers, just you and the king. Or envision you're going into the holy temple. And you're going into the inner holy chamber that only the high priest would go on Yom Kippur. And there is just you and God. So we want to take those images and really work through them to make them real to us, to acquire ownership on them, and to really ask, what do I do? Like, 
what's real here? How, how am I doing this? What's going on? And do I have this emotion? And how do I create this emotion? And I want to make this time of prayer sacred. I want to make this time of prayer meaningful. I want to make this time of prayer special. And did I do it? Am I doing it? How do I do it? So anyone would like to talk to that point, not only in terms of what we pray, as we said initially, but how we pray with this idea of the wings, the wings of prayer, our love and fear of God, which enables our prayers to fly to God and understanding this premise of how we pray. How can you apply it in your own reality now? It's definitely been a struggle, honestly, figuring out how to pray and how to relate to God. I, 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 I kind of compare it as like, it's as if you had like a relationship, you know, with someone, you know, a brother or a cousin or whatever, like your whole life. And then as an adult, you find out something about that relationship, right? Oh, wait, secretly, they're your twin, like something dramatic that like fundamentally changed the relationship that you thought you had. That's kind of the only analogy I can think of with like what it was like going from being a fundamentalist Christian to a Noahide where it's like, it's been tough to figure out how to relate to like get old bad ideas out, even in prayer. That's why I, I kind of like the prayer books because I feel like off the cuff, like maybe I'm not, you know, maybe that it's not totally right um, or kosher, if you will. So it's, it's, it's been tough because it definitely like has felt what you're saying about needing the prayer book. So you don't like slip into Christian ideology, but basically, yeah. And saying, like in terms of love and fear, are you saying when you try to focus on that, you feel like you're going into a Christian space? No, it's more like, I, I, I appreciate you mentioning that because it's like, I need, I, I should do something more like that before I start praying for me. It's like, if I have a minute. It's like, okay, grab the book, sit down and just do it, right? Like like exercise. Instead of getting into this like focused mental space, it's been tough. It's been really tough in a lot of ways because it's like, I don't, it's been a big change to like the, um, you know, going from like a, a handheld radio to a video phone. Like it, it's different. It's just, I, I, I'm trying to think of how, it's been tough. It's been tough to like relate and figure out how to pray and figure out just, everything. And I don't even know that I'm describing it very well. So I appreciate this class is what I'm saying. Good. I appreciate that. Um, I, and I also understand what you're saying about having this backstory of Christian ideology and wanting to make sure that that's not what's creeping in, which you're right. Therefore, it is better to use a guide, a prayer book, because maybe you're scared if it's extemporaneous, mm -hmm. you, might, you might pull out the Christian stuff somewhere embedded in your brain. And that's, that's a good point. I think, especially for Noahide, it's really worth it to take that time to focus on, I think the easiest thing is to feel how much you love God, because the easiest thing is to feel how much God loves you. And as you're really focusing on how much God loves you, you just feel love for God. And it's also really easy to feel a, a vulnerability to God. When you think of your own weakness, you think of your own limitations, you think of what's going on in this world of ours. And it's easy to feel very, very, very vulnerable, which really is a step of, of, of fear and awe, reverence of God. So I think we can elicit both of those emotions and it takes time. And the more often you do it, the more smooth it goes. Like the road gets smoother, the road gets smoother, your muscles get better, the, your perception is sharper. And it just goes much more naturally for sure. And the first time could be pretty overwhelming and could take quite a bit of time. But the second time will take less and the third time will take less until it becomes this like well-oiled machine, like a very strong muscle inside of you of evoking love for God by really thinking of how much he loves you, needs you, mm -hmm. how much he's there in your life. And just really thinking, just literally thinking of his, the most recent kindness to you. And then add another one. And then add another one. And then just circle in your brain those three most recent kindnesses and kindnesses and kindnesses. That's it. Like, you know, you got him. The other idea, as we're saying, is fear. Where you'd be stopping and focusing on your vulnerability. God's strength, God powers, what's happening in the world around you to, to other people, to their families and your vulnerability going back to your own home. Mm -hmm. 
And now, when you have those emotions, start talking to God. So again, you have a bit of luxury wiggle room that a Jew doesn't really have. Because a Jew has certain prayers they have to say every day, and they take a certain amount of time. So they could say, whoa, I'd love to spend this time creating my love and creating my fear, but I don't have the time. I have I allocated for myself 20 minutes to pray. I don't have the time for this. But a Noahite doesn't have to read any of the words they have to pray. But they have no obligation to read this prayer over this prayer. So when you take the time to really pray meaningfully, and then however many minutes you have left, you're praying to God from that very meaningful space. That's really, really, really valuable. And don't worry, if you keep up with it day after day, most days your introduction to prayer will go much and much, much faster. The prayers <laughs> themselves will be smoother and you'll just be so much more content with what you're doing in this world. Obviously, not only in prayer, but in other things as well. But primarily, you said, primarily in prayer itself. And the more you make it meaningful, evoking the emotion of love, evoking the emotion of fear, giving God your gifts that he will help you develop this love and fear. This is, yeah, this is a point of, of beauty. Anyone else? Anyone struggles or successes on prayer? Prayer is very powerful. You know, it says biblically how Jacob, how Yaakov had two eyes, Rachel and Leah. And both of them extolled in prayers. We're told about Leah that her eyes were red from crying. Her eyes were like sore, a little puffy, red, very sensitive to the sunlight because she was always crying. And why was she always crying? Because she knew she was destined to go to Aesop. And she didn't want to go to Aesop. So she wasn't just crying like, oh, I don't want to do that. But her crying, her tears were a prayer. And her prayer changed reality because she was supposed to go to Aesop. She was destined for Asav, and all of her prayers changed reality. And she went to Yaakov instead. When we're talking about Rachel, Rachel also's prayers changed reality because Rachel was barren. Actually, we're told all of the matriarchs were barren. All four of them were barren, including Leia, who had a baby right away. God just changed her from her barren state. But all four of the matriarchs were barren. Why? Because God desired their prayers. And Sarah prayed with Abraham, and eventually she was blessed with a child. And Rebecca prayed with Isaac, and eventually she was blessed with a child. And God shifted Leah's barren state, like, immediately. And then we have Rachel, who prayed, who was blessed with children, who was also scared she was going to fall in the lot of Asa when she saw she was barren. And yet her prayers also changed reality. And she had children, and she stayed the wife of Jacob. So we really see this is the energy of prayer. Leah was supposed to go to be Asaph's wife. Her prayers changed reality. Rachel was supposed to be barren, as was Sarah, as was Rebecca, as was Leah for that matter. But their prayers changed reality. Our prayers also have the power to change reality. As we said, tefillah is from the root word tofel to join. That's the point. Our prayers are to join, to fuse with God. It's the most fundamental way to send ourselves up to God, just as learning Torah is the most fundamental way to bring God down. This was the most fundamental way to send ourselves up to God. Most fundamental way. And when we're looking at prayer, we said, pray with heart. Pray with feeling. Natalie was saying, well, she's just trying to get the words out, and that's an accomplishment, which is true. But with prayer specifically, we really need feeling. Meaning, ideally, every commandment we do should have feeling. When you give charity, there should be feeling. There should be love and fear of God. And when you refrain from gossip, there should be feeling. And there should be love and fear of God. And when you honor your parents, there should be feeling. There should be love and fear of God. And everything we do, we're serving God. And everything we do, we should have feeling. But especially, we have to have feeling when we pray. Because literally, it's half, at least, of what's going on in prayer. Meaning, prayer has two aspects. The action of prayer and the intention of prayer. The action is the movement of the lips and the voice that comes out. That's the action of prayer. 
So the person prays devoutly in his heart and doesn't even move his lips. And obviously you don't hear a voice. He didn't pray. He was so devout. He was wrapped up in contemplation for two hours. He said every word like pearls. If he didn't move his lips, if he didn't have that body, then he didn't pray. It didn't count. He didn't do anything. And that's like many commandments that you have to do the thing to do the commandments. And if you didn't do it with all your good, if you really have loads of feeling and love and desire to help the pauper, but you never give charity, well, you didn't do anything. <laughs> you gave monopoly money. Well, that didn't count. It was a nice gesture, but that's not called charity. That's called a nice gesture. We want charity. You got to do something. It's not enough just the action. We need the intention. And the intention is the heart. The love, the emotions of the heart, that is the intention of all our discussions. That's the main point. Now, if I'm saying we need action and intention, which do you think is more important? Intention. You think intention is more important. Why? It's like from your heart. Prayer. Prayer is the heart. This is prayer. It's what's called service of the heart. And that's the intention. Anyone else? Any other thoughts on this? What's more important, action or intention in prayer? Okay, Robin was the lone voice that voted. And the truth is, it's interesting because I would have said exactly what Robin said. I would also say intention is the most important thing, as I just explained to you. Prayer is called service of the heart and you need the heart and every commandment we need intention, but prayer is mandatory. But actually, even in prayer, action is more important. Which means if someone prays just with his eyeballs, don't hear a voice, no movement of the lips, there was no action, the prayer didn't count. You have to move your lips. There has to be a voice. Otherwise, there's no action. You didn't pray. So when we pray, we always, we're always, um, wait, we don't talk out loud. I mean, like loud, but we, we are moving our lips and we're saying the words and we're, act, we're praying to God. And you need to have a voice. Right. Your voice is. Your voice has to be heard. It has to be yes. audible. Yes. In other words, when you're in the Amidah, in the Shemona Esrei, even there, you're supposed to hear the voice, but mm -hmm. it, it should be very soft. Yes. Not enough to disturb someone else, but still audible enough for your ears. But any other time of prayer, besides the Amidah, besides the Shemona Esrei, you're supposed to pray in an audible voice. Yes. You're supposed to pray in an audible voice as part of the action. So it's very interesting because prayer has two components. It has a component of action, very important, as we're saying, if you don't have the action, it doesn't count. And also as the component of intention, as we're saying, very important, the service of the heart, this is prayer. Every commandment needs intention to make it meaningful, but only by prayer is it, so to speak, mandatory. It's literally 50% mm -hmm. of the commandment. It's not the icing on the cake. It's the cake. It's real deal what you have to do. But in the end of the day, so what you're supposed to do is have action and intention and you get a full service to God, check on your chart, you pray like God is asking on some level. No action and loads of intention, you didn't pray. Action and no intention, you did a poor job, but more or less it counts like you prayed. Because really, we need the action. Action is about affecting our body. Action is affecting our animal soul. And that's why we're in this world. We're in this world to make a difference in the physical arena. So we need to do those things that impact the physical arena in a physical level, like real physical prayer, like really turning to God mm -hmm. physically. And as we turn to God physically, really connecting, as we said, tefillah is that fusion. Then a person could say, whoa. So if you are saying action, intention, great job. Only action, no intention a pass intention no action not even a pass so if all that's true and we said love and fear are the wings and a bird needs those wings to fly and if you're saying well if you don't have intention but you have action it's sort of okay passable worst case scenario prayer but there's no wings the bird's not flying anywhere Remember, we said the commandment is the bird and the love and fear are the wings that takes this bird and allows it to soar to heaven. My prayer is the bird. My love and fear are the wings that allow my prayer to fly. But if I don't have any love and fear, my bird's wings are clipped. 
It can't mm-hmm. fly anywhere. So I have the action. I'm moving my lips and you hear my voice and I get this nice check that I prayed, but the prayers didn't go anywhere. So how could we say, not that it's good, none of us are saying it's good, but all right, just passable, worst case scenario, you still prayed because you moved your lips and we heard your voice, but you didn't have love and fear. You have no wings. Your prayers didn't go anywhere. What's the point? So that's a great question. (laughs) The point is because eventually, if you keep praying mindlessly, heartlessly, meaninglessly, we trust that at some point you're going to pray for real. And when you pray for real, it will elevate all the other prayers. So yes, if you pray and you hear your voice and you move your lips and you are in space cadet land the entire time, your prayers didn't go anywhere, but we trust that someday they will because they're like sort of hanging around here. And when you pray this prayer correctly, they'll ascend with that prayer, with the love and fear, with the wings of that prayer, this prayer too will ascend, which is sort of reassuring because of course, there's many times when we pray and we, uh, yeah, we're, we're in another world. We're in a tremendous rush. We're racing the clock. We're trying to say the prayers and we've got to go here or there. We have all these things that we've got to take care of or all these thoughts in our brain that we have to file away in the right com- compartments of our mind. We have a lot going on and still we're supposed to be praying to God. So it's really comforting to know that if today my prayers weren't that good, Maybe yesterday also, maybe the day before also, but at a certain point, I'm going to do it right. And when I do it right, all of those wingless prayers will ascend. And that's very, (laughs) very, very reassuring. As someone who many times does not pray properly and every once in a while gets a right prayer in, it's very reassuring to know, wow, whoa, heaven is now rocking with all the prayers that are ascending with his one prayer that happened correctly. Now, Robin says she prays three times a day. I think Dixie said at least two. When we're talking about this real service of the heart is the morning prayer. That is the most important prayer to really focus, to try to really emotionally connect to God and really soar with love and fear. And again, you have no obligation to pray more than once a day. And if you are gonna pray once a day, that is fine and try to do it in the morning. If you're praying the afternoon prayer, The afternoon prayer, almost by definition, is sort of drenched with a love and fear of God. Because it's really hard in the middle of the day to stop and pray. Like you're really doing this and doing that. No, no, stop. Okay, I gotta stop. Gotta talk to God. So that in of itself already gives it a certain spiritual light. Because you're disengaging yourself, which is really hard for us. And you're talking to God. But the morning prayer is much longer. The morning prayer is when you have the time to really, really try to connect. But again, as I said for Nohide, you don't have to read through all the traditional prayers. You can say your own. I, I appreciate what Natalie said. You can read it out of a Jewish prayer book, a Nohide prayer book. You can choose Psalms you're going to say. So you can make it short, but try to make it meaningful. Try to make it have intention. And intention means involvement of the heart as we're saying love and fear intention also means involvement of the mind now of the two the heart is more important than the mind because prayer is really called as i said many times today service of the heart it's service of the heart and therefore we need to engage our heart and therefore we need emotions but at the same time we also want to engage our mind and we want to have an intention an intent we want to have something in our mind as we're saying the words, you could have, God really wants to hear my voice. It's incredible. He's the ultimate King. He's the creator of all. And here I am one speck of mankind and God wants to hear my voice. I'm that important to him. That's an intention. It's something you can have in mind that your mind is also engaged and focused and connecting to God. You can envision prayer as a very precious situation. Imagine you have the opportunity to talk to the king of all kings. You could envision it as a, as a opportunity. You can envision it as a time of battle. Every word is a battle. The battle is to stay focused on what you're saying and not to have extraneous thoughts in your head. That's a difficult battle. We're like the ultimate ADD generation. We have to stay focused 
and not have extraneous thoughts, what a battle. Yes, it is. So you can think I'm battling the battle of God. I'm battling to stay focused. I'm battling not to have extraneous thoughts. I'm fighting God's fight. I'm praying. You can think of the meaning of the words. Obviously, as you're reading the prayers in English, you should know what you're saying. But again, you could understand every word, but still completely space out and have no clue what you just said. Or you could harness your mind and really focus on the meaning of what you're reading. And that's totally mindfully engaging your mind in prayers. You can have an overarching intention. You could say, God, I'm doing this because it's your will. That is the most overarching intention I know anytime you serve God. You could have that overarching intention. God, I am dressing modestly because this is your will. God, mm -hmm. I am not gossiping. Do I really have something I want to say to someone right now? Because this is your will. God, I'm filing my taxes and I'm being honest because this is your will. God, I'm being patient with this person because this is your will. So God, I am praying. I have other things I got to do, but I'm praying because this is your will. Mm -hmm. You could say, you can have another arching intention. God, accept my prayers as if I knew what I was talking about. It corrects my prayers as if they were saturated with all the intentions of the Kabbalah. Accept them as if, as if I was really focused on how small man is and how great God is. So any of these things I just said are all valid prayers. I think Natalie's showing us that she found it. She I just found it. I walked over to where we had our Hanukkah at Hanukkah time and it was sitting right there. Okay, well... This is, this is this is the time. This is the class. So obviously you found it. Not surprised at all. So we were just going through a lot of different intentions. I just threw out you. I don't know how many. You could pick one. Use it as long as it works. Free of charge. You could share it with other friends. It's not working. Switch it off for another one. Sometimes this works. Sometimes this works. Sometimes this works. Sometimes this works. Make up your own. The idea is... We want to do the action of prayer. We want to move our lips. We want our voice to be heard. We want to do the intent of prayer. We want to have the emotion. As we said, before you start praying, prepare yourself and feel your love and fear of God. Let that saturate your prayers. Let your prayers have strong, healthy wings to soar. And this is the last point we we're discussing. Fill your mind with something. Now, obviously, your mind can be full of what you're reading, and that is totally fine. Plus any of these overarching ideas or just exactly what you're reading. That's fine. That's beautiful. Or a combination of some of these ideas I shared. But then you have your action, you have your heart, and you have your mind all creating this most beautiful prayer for God. And if you're crunched for time and it's taking five minutes to prepare and you have five minutes left to pray, that's fine. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Whatever it takes, whatever time you have. When you're doing it, do it right. And however short a time you have, you will feel, as we said, you just entered the Sabbath. You just entered redemption. Prayers mm -hmm. of redemption. You just entered redemption. You and God are one. And that's such a beautiful, rejuvenating space. You'll just want to stay in it longer. So we will stop for now. And God willing to be continued next week with more specific ideas of prayers. And I also like to get into blessings as well. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you found this practical and useful. And obviously Natalie did because she found her prayer book. And you just put it right on the top of my desk. So I'll do it before I start work. Great. That's a perfect, perfect, perfect time. And then all your work will be blessed. <laughs>